Well, thank you once more for coming today to worship with us. It's a, an exciting day. I don't know if you realize it, but we've been on a long journey together. And this is actually the last day of that journey. You, you have been having such a good time, you didn't even know you were on a journey, right? We started back in January. We've been working on a series of the essentials of discipleship. We've talked about the essential truths and uh, that God has called us to believe from his scriptures. We talked about the essential disciplines that make us stronger disciples. And more recently, we've been talking about our essential engagement. How do we apply all that? How do we get engaged with one another as a family of God and do the things God has called us to do? And for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at our essential commitment to mission. What is it that God has called us to do? How are we supposed to engage in the world around us and bring God's power and influence there? What, how are we supposed to take on that mission? And we've tried to look at it from a little different angle than maybe sometimes we hear about. And we've used as our guide Paul's second letter that we have anyway, the Second Corinthians. And we found message in, messages in there about how God wants his people to impact their community and the world around them. And we found two weeks ago, he's called us to be these ministers of comfort, that there's a lot of pain in the world. And as followers of Jesus, we're giving tremendous powers to comfort those in trouble. Last week, we talked about being ministers of encouragement because it's a broken world and people get discouraged and want to give up. And God gives us tremendous reasons to get engaged in this world and encourage people with this yes that comes from God. And now we're going to complete that by looking at another power that God gives to us, another challenge that he gives to us, and that is to be ministers of forgiveness. So let's jump right into the story, and again, it comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his, the second letter that we have, and it starts this way in chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. He says, For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. What Paul is talking about here is a certain kind of grief. Usually when we think of grief, it's grieving over someone that we've lost. They've passed. They were someone we cared about. Now they've left this tremendous hole in our life, and we have to begin to find a way to go forward and and deal with that vacuum that has been left by their absence. But this is a similar kind of grief. We can also grieve when we lose a relationship. Someone we care about, we trusted, and now they've hurt us, they've betrayed us, they've abandoned us, and once again, we're left with a vacuum in our lives. We're trying to recover and reorient ourselves. How do we move forward? Not to mention all the problems that that sometimes cause in family life, children life, financial world. When someone just walks away, there's a lot of grief that has to be born when a relationship falls apart. Well, Paul's talking about that kind of grief, and we know some detail. If we go back into 1 Corinthians, we get kind of the the essence of the story. It's about a person in their church, and those were small churches that met in homes, so people knew one another. And apparently there was a gentleman in that church who was sleeping with his father's wife, just blatantly, openly, obviously against the, uh, the commands of God. And Paul had to write to the church because instead of confronting the issue and having the crucial conversation with the man, they were actually proud that it was going on, that they, are, they allowed it to take place. They, they, they kind of used it as a badge of honor. And Paul pushed back against them and said, you know, no, that's, you have to do something about this. This, is, this man is hurting other people. And so the story goes that they actually listened to that advice. They had a crucial conversation with this man. And they invited him not to return until he was ready to own his problems until he was willing to own the damage that he did. That's the grief that that church was experiencing. Some of you, you may have been a part of a church that have been through something like this. In the church world, we call this moral failure, right? Somebody we care about in the church, a pastor, a leader, does something wrong, and I can tell you that that is a very grieving process. When something like that happens, 
People grieve for years. Sometimes they never get over it. Uh, the people that were hurt and damaged, the trust that was violated, the, pe- the pastor that they lost, the, the community life that they lost, people leave and they carry that hurt with them. That moral failure, it causes a tremendous amount of grief among God's people. But it's not just the church that experienced grief because of moral, moral failure. Uh, we have a phenomenon going on in our culture right now outside of the church. There's some sort of moral reckoning going on. It's almost like a, a moral house cleaning going on. All of a sudden, people are being held to account for sins that they committed long ago, things that they said, things that they wrote. They're, they're being held to account. There's a moral outrage about all of it. And sometimes the people are no longer even here. It's, it's damage that was done centuries ago, and people are still dealing with that grief. And we may not always understand it, Sometimes we may not agree with it. We may not know how to respond to it. But the truth is that it's there. We see it on the news every day. It seems like the emotion is building up. People getting angrier and and, and more hurt, more division, more failure to kind of come to terms. So this moral outrage, for whatever reason, it seems to be a contemporary issue even in our culture. And to be honest with you, I don't know where it's all going to end. I know this, that collectively, we have a lot of sins in our past that have to be dealt with, right? We, we all have done things, and you put this all together as a nation or a culture or a region, there are a lot of unknown sins that when they come out, they're going to cause a lot of damage. So we have a lot of stuff to process here. But I also know this, that that struggle We'll only go longer if we're not willing to listen. If we're not willing to take seriously the cries for justice and the cries of pain and the people that have been hurt, that have been processing for years, if we're not willing to listen and try to understand where these people are coming from, if we're right to the, way, right to the place of dismissing and disregarding and minimizing their pain, yeah, we're not going to get through this. We're just going to prolong it. But I am concerned. If we stay for too long in this place of anger and vitriol and righteous indignation and judgmentalism, we will start to destroy ourselves. We will become prisoners of the hatred and the anger and the division. Paul is telling his church that it's time to go beyond the grief. He understands the grief. The grief was legitimate. There was a legitimate loss. Legitimate damage was done. But at some point, we have to move beyond the grief and begin to experience the healing touch of God. And in order to get beyond the grief, to find that victory over grief, we're going to have to become experts in this thing called forgiveness. Small word, big challenge. Look at verse 6. Paul says, The punishment inflicted on him, that is this offending person, by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. See, the good news is that this man, after what he was confronted, after this crucial conversation, eventually he admitted his fault. He admitted that he was wrong. He admitted that he'd done damage. He he took ownership for his failure. That's a miracle in my book. I mean, I've been doing ministry for a long time, and I've had more than my share of crucial conversations with people. And the number of times they actually admit that there's a problem, yeah, very few. So the fact that this person actually said, yes, I'm at fault and changed his life, that is amazing. And so Paul is saying, now that he's taken that step, he's admitted there's a problem, the church ought to be a place now where you come alongside that person and restore him and encourage him and help him to recover from that damage. From the time they're little children, we teach children to say, I'm sorry, when they hurt somebody. I'm not a parent myself, so I'm not sure how successful that would be. And I don't mean to be critical of parents, but I'm just saying sometimes it appears to me that when children say that, they don't really mean it. <laughs> like you've told them to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry but they seem to be just going through the motions. Whether they're really experiencing sorrow, I don't know. And it's not just children. Like, I've been doing counseling of married couples for a long time, and there's a lot of apologies there that don't sound totally sincere. 
I mean, sometimes it sounds more like I'm sorry I got caught instead of I'm sorry I did something wrong. You know, there, there's this, that, that, that whole venue of apologies that are kind of offered in word, but it doesn't have the sorrow that's in I'm sorry. Somehow we haven't owned the sorrow, the, the, the damage that we did. Apparently this man was there, though. His apology was sincere. He, he was owning his failure. And Paul says, once someone owns their failure, now the healing can begin. It requires the church to come around. The culture in which we now live is not a very safe place to admit that you failed. It's not a safe place to admit you're, you're wrong. In this culture, if you admit you did something, you reveal your secret sins, bad things can start to happen. You could lose your job. You could lose your income. You could lose your reputation. You could lose your spouse. You could lose all kinds of things. Our culture tells us not to admit. Cover up, cover up, cover up. Do whatever you must because you just can't confess that you failed. What Paul is saying to the church is there ought to be one place where people can come and confess that they're a failure. Confess where they have failed. Admit their problems. There ought to be one safe place where you could come. And what you're going to find there is not a bunch of judgmental people that are willing to categorize you and minimize you and marginalize you, but you find a community of people that understand. But it, because it turns out they're not perfect either. <laughs> They've made mistakes. They have skeletons in their closet. They've been working through. But this is a community that's an expert in the grace of God. So we don't require people to wear badges on their outfits to declare where they've sinned and gone wrong. No, we, we're all sinners saved by grace. And so this is a safe place for people to come and experience that healing that they need. Because otherwise, as we saw in the children's sermon earlier, these people are carrying around that burden and they just don't know how to move forward. We can be the place to help them learn to lift that brick off their load and receive the forgiveness of Christ. And we could share our own experience of how that forgiveness changed our life. If we could get out into the world with that message, we understand in the world you can't admit your fault, but come here. This is where you'll find a place where we get it. And we can start the healing process together. And something happens when we provide that space for people. There is power there for us to begin to get over our grief and begin to heal and begin to come together. There's power to get through the sorrow that comes from my sorry. And it's a power and a victory that applies to everyone. Look, look at how Paul continues in Verse 9, he says, another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. Paul is participating in this forgiveness. He's asking the people to do this for everyone's benefit. See, when this man comes forward and the church forgives, everybody is victorious. The man is victorious because now the healing can begin. Now he can begin to own and begin to repair what was damaged in himself and in others. And make his amends and God in his grace can begin to restore him and his relationships. The church wins. Because the church now gets somebody convinced by grace. <laughs> somebody who's experienced grace. Who now can go out into the world and talk about grace. Who can share grace with others because it's not just a word to him. He's experienced it. He's been delivered by it. So the church wins by having this new person in their community as a living witness and a testimony to the power of God to heal, forgive, and restore. And Paul wins because he's preaching this message and now he is convinced, hey, it worked. <laughs> One time of how many, it worked. He's encouraged. He wins. He shares in their victory of forgiveness. See, the math, I think, is pretty simple. The logic is pretty simple. If we're going to go out into the world and bring people into this church, we're going to have to be good at forgiveness because here's the truth. Out there, there's only broken people. In here, there's only broken people. In fact, we don't let perfect people in this church. 
It's in our bylaws. No perfect people allowed. Only imperfect, broken people are allowed. And if we're going to go out into that world and invite people to become a part of our community, by definition, we're going to have to learn forgiveness because there are a lot of things that were done out there that people are feeling regretful about. And we've got to convince them this is a safe place to talk about that. We're not here to judge, condemn. We're here to build up, to encourage. Now, that doesn't mean we're just going to wink at sin or ignore sin or, or minimize sin. We're going to have tough conversations because the healing can't begin until we understand that what we're doing is detrimental to ourselves and others. We have to have those tough conversations. We're not going to kind of veer away from God's truth because it's inconvenient. No, God's truth is the pathway to healing. But when we're willing to accept that truth and respond to that truth, then we can move forward and we can begin to be a healing place. So we're going to have to, if we want to grow this church, be very, very good at forgiving people, forgiving one another, because people, we make mistakes all the time. But there's one more power that comes from forgiveness, one more promise of victory, one more blessing that comes from learning forgiveness. Follow, again, starting at verse 10 and, and through verse 11. It says, Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Paul says that there's an enemy out there that understands how to use our moral outrage. He understands that there's this division over right and wrong. And he's subtle enough and wise enough to begin to work it against us to divide us. Right now, the moral outrage in our society, it has its divisive effects. People are on both sides of the issues. The, the split is happening. And of course, I've been in churches where this happens in a church and it splits the church. I mean, I've seen it too many times. The enemy knows how to use our moral outrage to divide us. And Paul says the way forward through that and victory over that division, victory over that enemy, is to learn the power of forgiveness. And he makes it possible for Christ's sake, in Christ. There's something about what Christ is, who he is, what he has done, that it gives us the power to forgive. See, when Christ dies on the cross, he validates our anger about sin. When we get really angry that someone has to pay for this, Christ says, I agree. Sin deserves death. He dies on the cross for that sin. He's not taking sin lightly. He's not dismissing it. He's not just pretending it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. He dies for it. That's how big a deal. So he's not minimizing our concern. He's validating it. But when he rises again, he tells us that this is not the end of a story. <laughs> Even for a sinner who's committed sins, there's new life. There's new possibility. There's new hope. Jesus rises again from the dead and gives us that life and starts a new life for us, reborn in his spirit, empowering us to not do the things we've done before. So this gives us the power to move forward, to forgive. So, and, that, and that's the really point. That's the point here. What's the point of today's talk? We started off with this challenge, like how, how are we going to become ministers of forgiveness in our culture. And I hope we've learned through Paul's words that it's precisely that victory is available to us when we allow God to empower us to forgive. The power comes from God to do this. So we're all challenged. That's our next steps. Like, how do we up our forgiveness game? Now, I realize that's easier said than done. Some, the reason we don't forgive is because people hurt us. We can't just dismiss that. And part of our fear about forgiveness is if we, we forgive them, they're going to take it lightly. They're not going to own it. They're, they're, going to, they're going to dismiss it. They're going to take advantage. That We have lots of reasons for not forgiving. Can I give you kind of a little tip that I have used over the years that I think comes from this truth? Whenever I've 
encountered a problem in my own life that I just can't get past. I, I just, I just, the failure, the weakness, the, I just, I'm stuck there, and I just can't get past it, and I keep judging myself and condemning myself. I always go back to this cross, and I remind myself that Jesus already died for my failure and my weakness and my inabilities. He died for that already. I don't have to pay the price all over again. He did that already. I need to be on the other side of he's in my heart, in my soul, and in my mind seeking me to rethink things and how to think differently and act differently and feel differently. I need to put my energy into that side as his spirit works in me. But on the other side, when someone hurts me, and I've been in those places in my life where I've been damaged by someone to the point that I can't forgive. I mean, I just can't. I, it's not in me. I don't want to just let that go. It's just too hard. I've learned to begin thinking about this cross, and I begin to say to myself, God, I can't forgive them, but I know you have. You've died on the cross. You took care of it. Somehow, in your power and your infinite mercy, you've been able to forgive. I'm not God, so it's hard for me, but you've forgiven so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to accept your forgiveness. Right now, I can't forgive, but I can accept your forgiveness because you're God. And I will tell you that over time, what starts happening in your soul is when you accept God's forgiveness for that person, because by the way, his, the cross paid for his sin too. That, that view of that person as, a, as someone God cares about, it starts to fill your heart and eventually you can forgive. And I know there's a lot to forgive. I, I, I talked to somebody after the first service. Terrible things happened in their, in their family. Murders and all kinds of horrible things. It, it's, it's not easy. But God did a powerful thing in Jesus Christ to begin to help us to break through. I would just urge us that if we move forward as a community here, that we're, we make it clear out there in the world that this is not a place for perfect people to come and pretend that they're perfect. This is a place where broken people come to experience the healing power of Christ, and we're examples of that because we're going to be honest about our shortcomings, and we're going to participate in God's healing grace. And one more step. When you came in today, you found a little handout on your front page. This is the journey we've been on since, uh, on, on, since January. It's discipleship essentials. We've worked through truths, disciplines, and engagement. And there's a reason why I, this is my first year here, and there's a reason why it took us through this long journey. This is the foundation that will enable us to move forward. The way we change the world out there is by, coming, by becoming stronger, more faithful servants of the Christ we follow. And this is just the highlights of how to do that. And I just encourage you to put this around and go back to it and just constantly Kind of remind yourself to keep growing deeper in the truths, in the, in the disciplines, in the engagement. There's a little website at the bottom, my little website that has a little class out there, just a way to kind of stay engaged with this stuff. But I, I just know that God has a number of trophies of his grace here, all scattered all throughout here online, that if we all just took the next step, whatever it is in discipleship, God is going to break down some walls, break down some anger, break down some barriers as we dedicate ourselves to him let's pray father we thank you for this tremendous power of forgiveness that you've given us that doesn't come naturally that isn't natural in our cultural and it's not not natural in our souls but through what christ did on the cross he gives us the power to forgive because you've already judged sin in him we don't have to continue to live in that world. We can now move to the world of grace and healing and restoration and forgiveness. May we become people who see through the faults and the flaws and see the people who are struggling to figure out where they went wrong and how they can go right. And that we would be encouraging, forgiving, comforting people in that journey. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.